So I would like to uh, first introduce, we're, we're doing the HPC track now, and I would like to firstly introduce Laura Schultz. She's the head of quantum computing and technologies and head of strategic development and partnerships for supercomputing in, in, in Leibniz Supercomputing Center. So welcome, Laura. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take one quick pause because I need to get into my system and get it fired up here. So excuse me one moment. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, so, Alan, I really like some of your opening points. Uh, so, you know, when we talk about um, heterogeneous HPC and the ability to offload particular types or particular portions of applications to best fit architectures as part of a suite of, of the architectures working together in concert to solve scientific problems. Uh, this feeds in really beautifully well into the topic that I'd like to talk to you about today, and that is quantum accelerated supercomputing. So now, a forewarning for all of this, I am an HPC person. And I am head of quantum at LRZ in supercomputing space. I am not a quantum physicist. I did not come up with the development of quantum technologies in a vacuum in this space. Um, I'm coming at it very much from the HPC perspective and how we're thinking about how quantum is going to feed into this entire ecosystem and become a pivotal type of application or accelerator for particular types and portions of applications that have eluded us in the, in the level of compute that we have not been able to achieve so far with traditional, I hate that term for HPC that comes from the physics communities, but the more classical what we think that we love and hold dear in HPC. So, as I mentioned, I'm from the Leibniz Supercomputing Center in Munich, so it's about a four-hour drive here. I know that because I did that this morning. Um, we have had a, uh, a program for quantum now for exactly one year. April 1st was the establishment of the department and when I took over as head of that brand new department. Um, but really quickly about LRZ, we are a compute facility for academic users in the Munich ecosystem, the Technical University of Munich, the Ludwig Maximilians University as well. We have German users as we're part of the Gauss Supercomputing um, Center, if you may have heard of that. And of course, as one of the uh, leadership class facilities in Europe, we also offer academic uh, users in the uh, European space. So regardless that this is a quantum talk, I am an HPC girl, so I will be showing you our current flagship system. This is SuperMook NG. Now, this is a this is a little bit old. She's been fantastic. Uh, she's done a lot of great work. Um, slowly going to be retiring out. We have a phase two system that's coming in here very shortly, and so we will be uh, changing this out. This is a system without GPUs because at the time that we did the benchmarks, didn't need it. But obviously, we're all moving in that, as Ellen had also mentioned, that we're all really moving more into the GPU. GPU machine learning space, and so our next system is going to be packed with that. Now, we offer a large portion of services, everything from the flagship systems, the cluster systems, testbed environment, um, visualization systems, all the way down to email systems, you name it. So we're really a one-stop shop for the users. Our, our users are a spectrum from the power users, the astrophysicists that we love, that pretty much code at assembly and you know, to squeeze every single uh, bit out of those systems, all the way to the more um, uh, domain heavy compute light users that really want to be able to use the computation for their scientific results and don't need to be so close and intimate to the architecture itself. As I mentioned, um, uh, a couple of years ago, I sat down and wrote the quantum strategy that we were going to pursue, uh, understanding that quantum was going to be a capability that we wanted to use and bring in for our users. Didn't really know a whole lot about it as an HPC center, what we were gonna be able to do with it, but we wrote the strategy to kind of get our bearings, figure out our principles and our strategic framework and approach. We started implementing that. We opened in March of 21 with our quantum integration center. 
And integration is our favorite word at LRZ because um, as we have this philosophy and approach that we've been working with with heterogeneous HPC compute and how we think about the interplay with different types of technologies, we were thinking right from the beginning, how is quantum going to integrate into the existing HPC infrastructure? What do we need to think about in order to make it effective for the quantum computing community users who have been using it for quantum mechanic problems, utilizing quantum mechanic calculation method, and also for the HPC users who are going to be thinking about having parts of their code, parts of their application that could be onloaded or offloaded to this particular type of technology to gain a level of compute that they've yet not achieved. This is our first system, obviously not operational because it's uh, with, the, with the casings down, but um, this was the first system that came in last year. This is a five qubit system. Now, I'm very much into realism with quantum. A uh, five qubit, my laptop can do better than that, than the calculation capabilities of that system, but it's really meant to be a target system for us to do our software development on. Okay, so, the first big question is, really, why is HPC QC so important? So again, right now, we see quantum systems as standalone. There are these you know, beautiful gold chandeliers. Um, companies are selling them as standalone products, right? Or they're starting to sell them as standalone products. Is that the continued future of them? maybe at the scale that we're at now, maybe for the next couple of years, but when we really start getting serious about the scale, is that going to still hold true? And we're fairly certain and we bank that it is not going to be, that the, the, the environment, the compute environment around quantum is going to have to be HPC bolstered for the pre-processing, the post-processing, the rest of the large scale application whose portion of the compute is not ideally suited for quantum, but for other type of architectures, for CPUs to GPUs, et cetera. So we see this in concert in this whole um, architectural suite for capability um, discovery. Um, let's see. Yeah, basically that's the main point I wanna get across with this. <laughs> I, I don't know if the slides are gonna be available, but really to hammer on that purpose and that point. Um, when, you know, when we were talking about um, you know, the data centers and the concept of this, there were a couple of interesting questions that came out, not just from the application side, but right now I've got a big cryostat. It's really, really cold. It needs liquid nitrogen, it needs helium, it needs compressors, it needs all this other technology that I haven't really had to deal with before in an HPC cent center. So bringing in like cryogenic technology into HPC center, this is a new endeavor for us. We have to think about these different parameters. If I eventually have a farm of cryostats, how am I going to manage all of that? How is that gonna make sense? If I've got a monolithic QPU or a couple of QPUs in the bottom of that cryostat, and I've got big massive supercomputer over here with all of these nodes working in parallel, what is gonna be the coordination of this from um, offloading to a monolithic uh, compute down at the QPU um, with the parallelism of the HPC? So there's the infrastructure questions, there's the hardware questions, there's the software questions in terms of the scheduling. Our deadly sin in HPC is to let nodes lie dormant, right? And to not let them compute. In the quantum space too, how are we gonna coordinate the different calculation times together? When are we letting the quantum system wait? When are we letting the HP system wait? We have to make sure that there is unity and coordination between all of this. So we're looking at local schedulers, we're looking at global schedulers, we're looking at the different sort of compiles that need to happen between these two. The software integration part is a fairly large effort, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. The other big thing that we think about in terms of the slicing is the culture. As I mentioned before, you've got the, compu the quantum, com qu quantum computing community over here that are thinking in circuits, they're thinking in Python, they're thinking in these realms here, they're not thinking so much about multi-tenancy users on the chip, they're not thinking about a lot of parallelization in the traditional form. On the HPC side, you know, we focus on standards, we focus on programming models, we focus on C, C++, Fortran. 
it's a different operational community. And so in order to bring these two together on the capability development side, we have to be able to really merge these communities in the patterns and processes that are familiar for them. And then for the science domain users, we need to abstract this away enough that frankly, your computational biologist who may be looking for some sort of speed up that could be happening on the, on the QPU, do they need to know that they're working on a superconducting qubit with a star topology or a lattice topology at this much qubit? Do they need to know that they're on an ion trap with this sort of capability? Likely not. It's going to be about the speed up that they're getting. So we need to learn to abstract for the users and make it in a way that they can adopt. You know, another deadly sin with new technology is when the benefit of the technology ends up being less than the cost to understand it, to port it, to use it. And so we're thinking, we're taking a very user-centric approach to this for how are we gonna bring these communities together and then how are we going to allow them to utilize this technology to get to their scientific results in a way that's meaningful. Okay, and then I, I don't wanna get into this too much because 15 minutes I could talk two hours solid at this speed on this topic, so. Um, but, but the idea is you know, we wanna stay user-centric, we, integrate into the supercomputer, and then we want to harden the technology in HPC centers. There's a whole big thing about, about um, warm temperature systems putting the fans on the side and not in the back, which is traditional. Wrong form factors, wrong water chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got a lot of work to do in standardization in that approach. Okay, but the idea is right now we have standalone systems with their own monitoring. When we think about HPC infrastructure and the whole ecosystem, we want all of that monitoring, all of those metrics to pull together to function and work as one homogenous unit. So monitoring is a big topic that we are thinking about. So I know we're gonna hear about EAR, um, EAR later on. We have, a, um, we have another parallel um, concept with their DCDB um, at LRZ. We have a couple of different approaches that we have, but the idea is pulling all of this together, and, um, and then we're actually doing that right now, pulling all of these different resources, pulling the quantum resources into this as well. Um, we have quantum computing appliance, HPC system on one side. We want to bring them together, as I mentioned, as QC accelerators. Uh, so. Quantum computing is high performance computing, right? And so it's part, it's another component to all of that. We've got glue codes, two separate systems. One is a whole lot of Python, one is not a whole lot of Python, and we need to bring that together and utilize it in a way that makes sense. Um, we've got applications. We're currently on big hunting grounds for hybrid HPC QC applications. Um, we're looking at things like variational quantum eigensolvers in that direction, looking at some low-hanging fruit coming from the, chem the quantum chemistry field, but then we're looking at optimization, we're looking at quantum machine learning potentials. Where is it that would be ideally suited to utilize the compute parallelisms between the two different types of architectures? And then I already mentioned community. So, we have a big research portfolio, about 11 projects that we have funded from the state, federal, and European level. Um, we've, that's on the quantum side, we're pairing it with our HPC projects, and we're really working on that integration all together. We are a part of this Munich Quantum Valley Initiative where we are responsible for taking three different modalities, superconducting, ion trap, and neutral, coming out of the Munich Quantum Valley environment, seeding them in our data center, and then building the agnostic software stack for them, uh, connecting it with our current and incoming HPC systems. And we call that the Munich Quantum Software Stack. This is a quick little tour of, um, I'll say it so boldly, my <laughs> uh, quantum integration center. We have a cold lab, we have a warm lab. Our cold lab has four bays for cryostats. Those are all still incoming. Our warm lab has a bay for a cryostat that I showed you before. The reason is, is because I'm learning a whole lot about construction delays right now, and so our cryostat is in our warm lab. <laughs> I've become an, un an unwitting and involuntary uh, facilities manager last year. Um, we, have, we have another system coming in. 
uh, which will be likely an ion trap system. And then my favorite, again, as an HPC person, this is our test bed. And so we call this the Wolperdinger. In German, the Wolperdinger is basically the English equivalent of a jackalope, right? So when you want to talk about cool um, heterogeneous art architectures, this is just packed with all the good fun stuff. Um, FPGAs, different GPUs, uh, smart NICs. I mean, we just kind of packed it all in. And so we did that because we wanted to create this test bed where we had all of these tools that we could do a whole lot of experimentation. So we have the cluster, we have the specialty nodes, log and storage, the standard. Then we have these quantum access nodes because this is the current model. The vendor software, the firmware, goes on the access node, runs to the control electronics, and I know you're seeing that ethernet and going, why mm -hmm. ethernet? That's because the control electronics companies are using ethernet right now. We're, we're hoping to convince them otherwise, but we have this pathway that we work to, um, to bring all this together. The idea is that we've got the test bed where we have the superconducting, the ion trap, the neutral atom. We have all of that where we can conduct these experiments and figure out things like our different pathways. And I've got 30 seconds, so I will go, I'm almost wrapping up. Um, but we have these pathways where we have to look realistically first at providing the quantum users the pathways that they need that they're familiar with, with the access on frameworks, on visual graphic editors, uh, circuit editors, providing them a way to get access to the systems, but the fun stuff starts down here when they log into the HPC node, use programming models, learn how to offload, and um, have that compute. The idea is that the knowledge that we get from the quick gets applied to the production system. And those systems are coming in because of the Euro HPC joint undertaking system that we have. Barcelona also has one of them coming in. And we're, we're purposely meant to buy a system that connects to our HPC and that the, um, figures out how to use the, the software and figures out how to um, connect. We're also part of a European project called OPER Soup and Q Plus on the superconducting side, specifically to help align and coordinate HPC QC integration efforts at the software. And last slide, um, if you're interested in more, we've set up this uh, website, hpcqc.org, um, that has some of our activities. The thing that I'm actually having to leave you to go to now is a um, European Quantum System Software Summit that we've organized with all of the joint undertaking centers um, where we're gonna be talking more about how we're going to do all of this together. Uh, if you go to ISC, we have a BOF with those centers where we're gonna be talking about this project in, in a big forum. And then if you, any of you go to IEEE Quantum Week, same thing over and over again. So I know I went through this in a blaze of glory here. I apologize for the speed. I hope I've given you a little bit of a flavor and that this is really amazing and cool. Um, there's a whole lot of hype about quantum right now and a lot of it really is hype to be dead honest with you. But the stuff that's really fascinating is what's gonna be happening as quantum comes in as a capability within this HPC ecosystem. So that hype is genuine, and I hope that I've given you a little bit more flavor for it. So thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Laura. That's uh, very interesting. Um, we, we've got time for maybe one or two questions, if anyone's got a question. Fire hosed you. Sorry. Okay. No. Uh, well, if not, I. Oh. Great question. Um, to me, it's the define the practical. Right. <laughs> yep. So, so this whole thing. I mean, so when we were talking about this before, this whole quantum supremacy stuff. I am. I'm so over it, to be, be really honest with you, um, and I'm glad that that's starting to become less of a thing. Um, the idea of beating supercomputing, et cetera, that is going to be true for a particular type of applications that's going to be fantastic. Okay, but we're starting to talk more about quantum advantage, and when you look, when you think about, like, when you think about some of the big codes from like the DOE, right? These are millions of lines long, they're legacy codes, they've got portions of those codes that could be offloaded, you know, if you 
design it well using OpenMP, you know, particular pragmas, whatever, you could take some of those algorithms, replace HPC algorithms out with quantum algorithms, part of the application code, you could get speed up in ways that you haven't had before. And then, you, so is that an advantage? Is that practical? <laughs> yeah. And then there's also the 1% argument that I always like to bring up. In HPC space, when I worked with industry, you know, sometimes companies would do modeling and simulation, like race car design, and they would get 1%, 2% um, drag efficiency uh, you know, reduction, right? That equated to how many seconds of speed up across the line. Is that practical? Is that effective? They said absolutely, right? So this whole idea about the benchmark being quantum computing beating the crap out of HPC, Let's look at other ways. The other thing when you were talking about energy, um, here's something else to think about. Yeah, it's true that you can do uh, quantum calculations on a quantum system. You can do the same calculations on an HPC system. The HPC system can do it just fine, right, with the quantum, <clears throat> excuse me. But if you look at the energy cost for what it is on the quantum system versus the HPC system, if it's more efficient energy-wise to do it on the quantum system, is that an advantage? Is that practical? Yeah. So there's many, many different parameters and ways that we can think about this. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Laura. Thank very you. interesting.